This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at Craft Beer Brew. You gotta check out Hops on Tap, new at the Farmer's Museum in Cooperstown. It's all about the history of hops growing and beer making, with special demonstrations and tastings leading up to their big event, Hopsigo, on August 18th. Listeners can get $2 off admission by visiting farmersmuseum.org slash hops. Hi, it's John Hall, the senior editor of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine, and today I'm in a hotel lobby in Washington, D.C., a few blocks away from the National Building Museum, where the Brewers Association is hosting its annual Savor event. And sitting across from me right now is Tommy Arthur. He is the co-founder and director of brewing operations for the Lost Abbey and other breweries as well, which we'll get into in a minute. Uh, I'm sure the Lost Abbey is a brewery that most of you listening should be well familiar with. Tommy, thanks for doing this. Happy to be here. Uh, How's your hangover? Uh, Not so bad today. We'll we'll see about tomorrow. (laughs) Uh, you've been brewing for more than 20 years now, um, and you discovered brewing while you were in college in Arizona, yes? Yes, I did. Okay. Um, and you've been on the forefront of a lot of the major changes in the industry since then, in the last 20 years. And, and, and today, I kind of want to focus on how the industry has changed in the last couple of years, because people talk processes, and they talk about ingredients, and they talk about all of this, but, but you've had this unique vantage point and this unique perch where from almost the beginning you've had uh, a a following as it were I remember uh, watching the beer hunter and watching uh, some of Michael Jackson's uh, some of the movies that have made uh, made about him and it's like well we need to go see Tommy Arthur because he you know was making these uh, these amazing beers you were on the map um, very early on um, and along the way you've joined this this first name only club but I'm, I'm curious and I want to start off here is what surprised you about beer back then and what surprises you today? Like what is something that you never like occur- would have occurred to you when you first started? I think that there'd be this much sour beer in the world or that there's this, <laughs> this much uh, sour beer being produced today. Um, you know, to, to set the story, sort of, you know, going back to my college days, yeah. um, I did not travel a lot as a kid. And so my, my notion of going away to school and traveling through the world of beer was something that was really cool to me. I was able to read about countries and places and, you know, the, the, the stories in the magazines that, that, you know, took you to Czechoslovakia and took you to Spain and to Italy and the places um, that, that beer did, you know, have a history and it was, it was a very rich history. And then to be able to drink that part of that history and to really understand what a, you know, a, a company that had been around for over 100 years and the legacies. Um, and, and, you know, and of course, Michael's influence, Michael Jackson's influence on, on Belgian writing and the, the stories of the Belgian brewers is really what got me going. I, mean, I just I fell in love with the flavors of those beers that basically beer could be anything. And, um, and that's kind of how I, I got my my it got my imagination going. Was that the was that the introduction? Was it was it Jackson's books or was it something else? I didn't actually own any of his books. Um, it was a lot of the writings and all about beer magazine for one. Sure. Um, just you know, internet pieces and stories. Although the internet wasn't huge back in '95 when I was in college. Um, yeah, but dial-up porn took forever. So yeah, it like, did. It, it did. Yeah. And I still have my AOL account, and everyone knows that, so we're good. <laughs> Um, you do. You're one of the few guys. There's that, a few uh, of us out there. Reliable yeah. to get you that way. You know, it's it's just so great to hear you've got mail. I mean, I'm just so concerned that I'm going to go there one day and it's never going to say that. So um, maybe I just love it when Harry met Sally. I don't That's, know. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's just something in my, it's in my DNA. You know, it's we, the wrong movie. We joke about it a lot, but yes, you've got mail. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we joke about it a lot. I never met Brew Boy, but I've been Brew Boy 1 for a long time, so, you know, it's working. You've been doing it so long that if, if AOL was still around today, it'd be like Brew Boy yeah, 3000. 3, yeah. yeah, I think so. Yeah. And everybody would be, be, you know, trying to figure out who the original Brew Boy was. So, but what, so. Reading all about beer, uh, and I'm sure Celebrator uh, being out on the West Coast, yeah. and a lot of these uh, these other things, though. But what was the impetus to actually start reading about this? Like, where where did that come from? Did 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 your parents drink beer? Uh, uh, being in San Diego, you, you from there originally. Yeah. You, 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 there were 
breweries. A couple, yeah. yeah but very, very few. Not many yeah. to actually speak about even these days. No, no. I mean, Except in the annals of history. Yeah. So I left I left for college in 1991, yeah. and I was in, in Flagstaff, Arizona for four years. Um, and at that point, realistically, I mean, we had Carl Strauss, San Diego Brewing Company, Callahan's, Pizza Port. There were not many breweries in San Diego. Um, so that wasn't it, really. I think it just came down to I was I, I have a degree in English. I studied. I loved to read. I would get my hands around uh, trying to understand beer. And, the, you know, back then, the periodicals were a big part of that. There really wasn't, like I said, there wasn't a big Internet culture for uh, doing that. And uh, and barely a little, you know, barely barely on the surface, some homebrewing sort of stuff. But it really came down to periodicals and, you know, whatever magazines and books I could find. Um, so I just became a voracious reader, and uh, and that just led to, to thoughts of creativity and things like that. But it wasn't really until I got into sort of the, my, my first real professional uh, uh, pro- professional position at Survey Series La Cruda, um, where I, I learned under a gentleman whose name was Troy Hoyel, and Troy Troy basically said these are the four main ingredients in beer, and then you know you have to let your imagination kick in because we never want to make things like the guy down the street. You don't want to make things like the guy down the street. That brewery also lasted less than a year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's an old saying in journalism that you're not a real reporter until uh, you get fired or uh, the place closes down unexpectedly from underneath you. And that was uh, more apt uh, when we used to have more daily newspapers than, than we do right now. There's certainly a lot of breweries that are around right now. What did that teach you, though, being at a brewery that was so short-lived? We definitely didn't have enough cash, and that's always been in the back of the mind. You know, you have to you have to run a business. Um, you know, just because you have great product. I mean, we made amazing beers. It was it was really crazy when we hit the scene. Um, you know, we opened our doors in about April May of. of of uh, 1996, and people were blown away by the technical proficiency of the beer. So, what were the what were you making? Uh, we had a, a porter that ended up winning a gold medal at the Great American Beer Festival that year. We had an ESB, a pale ale, uh, a wheat, and some sort of a. We actually made a mild, but it was more of a blonde mild, so it was kind of a, a hybrid style beer. Um, but the beers were just pure. I mean, this was back in the day when people weren't making, uh, you know, weren't making awesome beer, and, and uh, they they just people really revered them for what they were, which was super clean. When you say people weren't making awesome beer, and, and you, you've had the, the opportunity to, to be on the front lines, there's still places that aren't making awesome beer. I mean, ha, it, the more things change, the more they stay the same? For sure. I mean, that's, that's just the, the cyclical nature of it. Look, not every restaurant's great either, but people manage to keep their doors open for whatever reason. But, you know, the, the goal, I think, as a brewer is to, to be amazing and, and to, to really, you know, embrace, you know, what your creative, you know, your creative side can be um, without losing it. Because I, I have a simple rule that we just don't do esoteric for esoteric sake, you know, and that means that we just don't throw... Sh- stuff in beer because we think it's going to make the you beer can say better. shit if you want yeah to, you know yeah. um you know we don't throw crap in beer for for the wrong reasons now there is a time and a place where sometimes crap in a beer makes sense um but for me you know i had to i had to I had to get out of that first job um and learn how to be a brewer i, I was basically taught how to, to 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 run a brewery how to clean how to you know how to sanitize um and then when i got to pizza port i had to develop my own recipes um, and one of the things that was interesting to me was I was at Pizza Port for probably two years, mm-hmm. um, and I was so scared every day that I was going to lose that job um, just because I wasn't good enough to have it, and, uh, or they were going to figure out that I wasn't the right guy for the job. And it took about two years before, um, it used to be every time I would mash in, I'd be like, oh my God, I'm going to blow this batch of beer. And probably two years into the process, it finally stopped you know, being nervous, and because I think I finally was in control of it in, in the way that I needed to be. Um, I think that there is sort of an imposter syndrome that, that exists, uh, certainly among writers, but, but with brewers as well, especially when you come to something in 96 where there were already established brewers. And even back then, uh, some of the brewers that were coming out of AB or coming out of uh, uh, Miller or Coors or any of these other places weren't uh, vilified by craft or microbreweries in the way that they are you know, today. It's, uh, I think brewers look at the technical technical proficiency that come from some of those larger brewers and also folks like Carl Strauss uh, and some of the other folks that, that came before them and they and they do worry about that or at least did. I wonder if do you put brewers who come to work for you now through those same paces that you went through? You know, we take a lot of we take a lot of things on faith when guys come to work for us. I mean I'm not in the brew house on a daily basis, but our methodologies at the brewery are pretty strong, and from the top down, we've always we've always hired people who 
um, you know, our, our goal has always been to hire people that worked at bigger breweries because they've seen more. Mm -hmm. And I think seeing, you know, seeing further is always that, you know, the, the, you can you can really rely on other people's intuition or scale. Um, and so, you know, of late, we haven't had to hire people that are that are, you know, out right off the homebrew dock kind of thing. And I. I had to learn how to be a brewer. I think that the, the first two years for me was about finding my voice and then my, really my, my, my conviction that I was, that I was in the right place. And then the beers could come out of that, that space, right? I could, I was allowed to be in charge of the, the creativity and, and I could make those things really, really fly. Do you remember when you found your voice? Because I, I forgive me for this, but uh, the beers that when people say, Oh, Tommy Arthur beers, they're not necessarily thinking traditional ESB or Porter or Miles or, or mm -hmm. anything else like that. They're thinking Belgian inspired. They're thinking uh, the, the box set that you guys do mm -hmm. or uh, any number of things that, uh, that, that get the beer geeks really excited and lined up and, and, and dropping big cash on, on, yeah. on, on big bottles, um, as it were. So when did you make that leap? And, and was it something that was always there or was it just shit, I have to do something different. No, I think that the, the biggest, the biggest first hurdle was when we, when we got Cuvée going, mm -hmm. um, you know, and got, you know, had this project, um, and the beer turned out really, really different and amazing. And I, you know, I put my name on it. We would joke about that a lot. It's the only beer that has my name on it. Um, but you know, we got, we got validation in the form of the Malt Advocate Beer of the Year Award in 1999. And it wasn't an award we could solicit or otherwise it just came out of the blue. Um, and that, that was one of those moments where, you know, and, and I've developed a great relationship with John since then because of that. To me, it was very important. Um, you know, we, we have had some great competitive success over the years and, and, and earned a lot of great things in, in, blind, in a blind environment. But those are, those are beers that we're, we're putting forth. And th this was something we had just, you know, put out into the world and it was received as being that, that groundbreaking. Um, and I, I think that's kind of one of the reasons that Michael fell in love with it as well, was that it just, it, it came out of nowhere. You know, it came out of this little brew pub in San Diego, three blocks from the beach, and it was Belgian, and it was bold, and it was different, and it was, and it was a pretty good beer. And, uh, and that really gave me the, the strength to keep, to keep, you know, keep tooling along in that, in that path. But to actually create that to begin with, uh, obviously you had the faith of the owners, uh, but you also had to... You had to conceptualize it as 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 well. Yeah, we did, and it was um, you know this is we're, we're celebrating the twenty years of Lawfully this year, right? So mm -hmm. this was certainly right around the time that uh, that Peter Peter came on the scene, and of course Peter Brukhart, yeah. Peter Brukhart, and then of course Vinny and, uh, from Russian River and myself had been talking a lot about wine barrel techniques and Brett and how we were going to do some things, and that's when they launched Temptation and. You know, for the longest time, we were going back and forth, having conversations about Brett and sour things, and how can you do this in an environment where you know it's not your brewery's not set up to do it. Um, and it, you know, we we just had to have a lot of conversations because nobody was doing it. And you know, Peter was a pretty big inspiration in that regard because he he was always you know just go for it, we'll figure it out. You know, our, our, we'll help you figure it out. And uh, but you know, the the Britannomyces, the acidity, the the barrel aging that Cuvée brought forth definitely gave me the confidence to pursue other other things and at the same time we were doing belgian style beers in the background and we had produced some saisons and things that were just weren't being done you know out west um and it you know every every chance we got to take a stab at something we, we were certainly able to do it you know a few weeks ago uh and by the way congratulations because you received the russell shearer award for innovation in craft brewing it's an honor that's handed out at the annual craft brewers conference we were in Nashville this year for it. Uh, 14,000 people uh, were there, and there's a lot of folks uh, in the room uh, as you were awarded this uh, and, and accepted the award. And during that talk, you actually spent a little bit of time thanking the founders, uh, uh, Vince and Gina from uh, Pete Support, uh, for what you called your artistic indifferences and burgeoning ego. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's something that isn't lost on me that I was very blessed to have found a job at a place where they cut me loose. They really never said no. Um, and it wasn't about profit and it really wasn't about don't do it. And I think it's funny because when you talk to Vince, he'll tell you the same thing. He's like, I was making crazy beers and things that he just didn't expect that people would, at a pizza place would drink um, or even seek out. Um, but because they never said no, it allowed it allowed me to become that confident in the process and really find find the voice that I you know that I was of innovation and and, and the you know the, the beers came out came out of that and 
it's 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 incredible to think that that, that as owners they never really stepped in and said you can't do that um, because there wasn't really a, a commodity you know commodity you know it wasn't commoditized it wasn't really uh, about a, a huge profit thing to it but it did build it did build the pizza port into something very unique. I mean, it's kind of crazy to think that a pizza based restaurant, um, you know, with picnic tables and plastic plastic plates or you know plastic knives, forks, and paper plates, could be considered a world class brewing destination. But that's exactly what we built. I want to talk about ego in a second, though. But twenty years ago, uh, thirty years ago. <laughs> I should I should point out that Adam Martinez, uh, who who runs uh, PR for the brewery, is, uh, is sitting next to me right now. And when I said ego, burgeoning, uh, burgeoning, yeah, burgeoning ego, ego. Yeah. Uh, he lost it a little bit as well. So um, I, I do want to get to that. But these days, if you talk about a small pizza place, no matter where it is, that makes really good beer, that's not as much a surprise these days as it would have been. 20 years ago. I mean, you look at Russian River built their foundation on pizza. Sure. You know, they took a cue. Um, you but know, I just, I, I don't even mean like a pizza concept, but yeah. I mean like it, you can be anything these days and, oh. and the ability is there for people to make good beer and, and, and you almost come to expect it these days if, yeah. you're, if you're a brewing entity. The, there are no rules, right? I mean, that's just it. The expectation used to be that you were a, a, a brew pub and you had burgers and, and chicken wings and stuff. And, you know, it just, you were you were fairly ubiquitous in that regard. And now it's like, it doesn't matter where it's made. As long as it's good, people are coming for it, which is fantastic. Let's so, talk about the ego. No, let's talk about ego right. because you went from saying that early on, uh, you know, you're questioning yourself and you're, you're, you're doing all this. And then you these days, I mean, you are regarded as one of the top brewers uh, in, in the U.S., you're, uh, in, in the world as well. You're sought after. Uh, people respect your, your, your opinion. Um, and it's hard not to, I'm sure, have uh, a, a bit of an ego about that. And, and I wonder, though, how much ego plays into brewing in general. And I don't necessarily mean from you, but there has to be a level of confidence. There has to be a level of yeah, I'm doing this, and you know, yeah, people are buying my beer, and and yeah, people are waiting in line, right? You know, yeah, it's um, it's funny because as a kid, I was very shy, and so I didn't have an ego growing up. I was mostly trying to hide in the corner, and you know, the 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 fact that people were people were lavishing praise on things that really came out of my head, and that mm-hmm. you know, that not only did they not only did we that I think about them, that we were executing them in such a way that they were being lavished and praised, and. That's kind of crazy to think that, you know, there's this kid that, you know, that I know that because I grew up with that kid and that kid wasn't very, um, you know, he wasn't very confident and he wasn't very out in front of things. And to be to be out in front of it and, you know, the beer is the, the vehicle for that is pretty crazy. I walked around last night with Jim Cook from Boston Beer and he Sam was Adams, yeah. yeah and he was introducing me to people and he was heaping some pretty strong praise. And uh, I, it's humbling. Um, but without an ego, if you you know the, the talented chefs, the people, you have to sell yourself a little bit. And unfortunately, if that comes off as being egotistical, that's that's a thing. I want to take a moment to, to yeah. because it's important for me. We also at the same time, and I, I say we because I was working with Tom Nickel and Jeff Bagby. Um, we were promoting San Diego as a region, and we were the, the region was on the elevation. So in 1995, when I got into brewing, 96, San Diego really wasn't known as a world class brewing destination but through the, the the late 90s and early 2000s as stone and other breweries really started finding success you know on a, on a regional basis the area you know really started to develop that and with that came a real sense of pride um call it ego if you will but but a real sense of pride towards uh the beers that i was personally creating um and that others around me were making as well and i'm born and raised in san diego so it, it, it's a very important detail for us that this town became you know measurably you know demonstrative as a world-class place and 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 it certainly has as well. And and I'm I'm curious though, when we are talking about uh, having praise heaped on you, how do you keep that in check at least a little bit, where it, it's not just you become the emperor with no clothes on? So hubris, right? Yeah. I mean, it's it's all about that. And we, we talked about this the other day. We did. Yeah. We did. Um, you know, I think I think my my not, not on this show. Yeah. But yeah. Like on the you, phone. You and me like, on the yeah, phone, right? Yeah. We had a call about this. Uh, I think that I think just the general, you know, I grew up in that classical literature and all the readings and things that I just that that sense that you know those you know uh, the, the the great poem by Shelley Ozymandias. Um, you know, you know, I am you know I am the king of the kings, and here I stand, and, and I'm a vestige of my former self. Um, you've you've got to take it with a little bit, but you know you're allowed to have some, um, just not too much. And I think that what's great about this industry is that there are very few people in this industry who are allowed to get away with having too much. 
Um, you know, there's some people out there that certainly walk into the room with a little more swagger than maybe they've, you know, than they've earned. But I think it, it checks itself pretty good at the door for the most part. How do you earn the swagger, though? I think you have to earn the, the, the respect of your peers. And I think that's one of the things that the, that the Russell Shear Award did for me was that, you know, it was a peer based award and it was, you know, you're nominated by your, by your fellow, fellow brewers and it can only be confirmed on you by, by the guys and the, and the women um, that have come before you as, as winners. And that's, that's what made that award so you know, monumental in my world is that, you know, it does, it does share, you know, it does share with you that the, that the people you respect um, feel the same way about you. During your acceptance uh, speech, for this year award, um, you you were very thankful to your peers, uh, to your fellow brewers, uh, and the industry in general. Um, and you said that you were obviously grateful for the honor. And then you said, "quote that you were uh, uh, quote also concerned about the direction you see the industry taking." Uh, this is a direct quote. "Quote we are becoming incredibly dependent on uh, uh, intimidation. Uh, I, I'm sorry, um, uh, imitation, and that saddens me." mostly because we all know flattery will get you nowhere. I've always felt our job as brewers is uh, to transport our consumers to faraway lands, places they didn't realize beer could take them. But lately, it feels like our industry has become reliant on collaborating solely on hazier shades of winter. Uh, it feels done and done. Can we please chart a new destination? It was pretty pretty bold. I it was, was. I was a little afraid of making that statement because it, it but really it stood out. Yeah, and I wanted it to. I knew that was my one spot. That was that was the denouement. But I mean, I, I I was concerned about making that or taking that shot. But I felt like I had to. Well, let, let, let's take this sort of point by point sure. though, because I mean, how do you see where things are right now? Because we, we talked about twenty years ago. Mm. We talked about building on the fundamentals, and then we talked about uh, you, you taking chances and 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 risks and everything. Do you legitimately see now that we have 7,000 breweries in the country that people aren't taking risks? Or like I feel that the, the real question and the crux of that, yes. that, that right there for me personally is, is how are we going to innovate with so many people doing things that overlap? And it doesn't mean that we aren't necessarily still innovating, but are we all pushing in different directions or are we swimming in the same pool? And I felt like you know I was pretty lucky in my career to have been in, at a point in time where there was a lot of room to innovate and there was a lot of room to seek new directions. And today it feels to me in some regard that, that we're, we're kind of stuck churning in, in the waters because we're so busy trying to keep afloat um, and, and that there hasn't been a, a real movement. Um, you know, I, maybe there has been a movement and I just don't see it, but I don't feel like there's a, enough innovation going on. But the, the challenge in that, in that quote for me was that I don't know how we're going to to get back to a level of innovation with so much churn, um, so much overlap, and you know, same same going on. I mean, the devil's advocate would say though, but we are seeing innovation. We're seeing pastry sounds, and we're seeing hazy IPAs, and we're seeing, uh, you know, people adding new ingredients to beer uh, all the time. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I, I don't know if that's innovation. I, I mean, that's I guess that's my concern with it, and it's something that I, I struggle with because it's not the kind of beer that that I would want to do, and. I, I lose my mind when, when people come to us and say, you should be doing these things. Um, like, I, for example, what? Like, what, what does somebody say that makes you lose your mind a little bit? Uh, you know, we should try this in, in the IPA, or maybe we should consider this adjunct or, or this, this process. Um, I've, and is it consumer or is it fellow brewers? No, it's more people that work for me. Okay. It's not my brewers, let's just put it that way. Okay. Uh, my brewers are pretty good. They're... Uh, they're fairly traditional in their in their makeup, but um, you know we, we we come from that we like to drink what we make or we make what we like to drink mentality, um, and and I think there's a lot of these beers that are currently out there that we don't love, and that's not to say that some of them aren't incredibly well executed, but I I find that to kind of hit that level of esotericness, like I had to add something to this beer to make the consumer come back. Well, the consumer should come back because the beer the beer was good enough to bring them back, not because you added something to it to get them to come back for that that checkbox. Right, but with so much choice these days. Even if somebody does want to come back, uh, there, there's the next shiny thing that gets yep. in their way that gets them uh, excited about uh, uh, moving on to the next brewery, at least trying the next brewery, and maybe even forgetting about the brewers that got them excited in the first place or the beers that got them excited. Yeah, and in I the think for place. me that the biggest hurdle is is how many of these beers that are being kicked out every week are skillfully executed. Yeah. And I think that that's the, the, that's the challenge in my head, which is to say, I don't mind the ones that are, that, that are really, that hit, the, that hit the hallmarks. I just mind the ones that are just horrible from the get-go. And, and they end up being more 
pursued for the wrong reasons than the right reasons. And that's a purist expression, but it, it, it just doesn't play for me. Do, do you see a lack of purity? I see a lack of clarity. I mean, a lack of, of why am I doing this? And I okay. think that was kind of the message in my, you know, like if you're, if you're talking about innovation and you're talking about why you're doing something and you're supposed to be able to tell your story or the story of that beer, uh, it shouldn't look like the, you know, the, the same thing as the guy down the street. And I mean, every press release that's going out today says, you know, we're opening our new brewery and it's going to be these same three beers, um, you know, and it just doesn't, it just doesn't really, it just doesn't make sense. How are you building an identity if you can't tell a different story? When you moved from Pizza Port to the Lost Abbey and you started really looking into making a lot of these uh, Belgian-inspired beers, uh, uh, both in the traditional sense and then uh, in what you call your non-denominational uh, sense as well, the labels tell a story. The beers tell a story. There is actual poems and, and, and short stories written uh, about each of these beers. Um, is that the English major in you coming out? Or is that... Uh, because again, when you're when you're saying to the to these folks, um, we need to take consumers to faraway lands, places they didn't uh, realize beer could take them. When I see a can that says DDH with mosaic and 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 citra, I mean that tells me nothing. Like right. it tells me something, but it doesn't give me any real sense of things. And I, and I find that frustrating as well. How much does the story play into the romance of beer? I think in my world, probably less than I, than I thought it did, or maybe, maybe not as much as I had hoped it would. Um, you know, I, I wanted to build the Lost Abbey brand around storytelling. I mean, you, you, all of our labels are original pieces of art. Yeah. I always felt that the back of the label was important because it was, it was a linguistic sort of technique for storytelling. And then the, the, the beer in the bottle itself was, was an ability to tell a story. So we, I always felt there were three unique components to that storytelling. One was the visual acuity of the label in the front, you know, mm-hmm. grab your attention. Um, let me tell you something on the back about the, the reason why that picture looks the way that it does. Um, and then let's, let's, make it all, let's make it all resonate in your world because, frankly, we've, we've given you a, a, a liquid that, that does, it, captures, it captures the essence of all of them. Um, and so it's always been a heavily storytelling brand for, for me. It, Adam's sitting next to us, but Adam's definitely had to struggle with the fact that, you know, our labels don't say that this beer was made with base malt, that, 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 that doesn't tell you anything. But if you go back and you think about some of the wineries and, and branding of, you know, of other things that are alcoholic in nature, they don't always tell you directives. They, they, there's a lot of, if you romance and mysticize and things like that, I think there's room for it. And it's crazy because today, fast forward back to I'm releasing this beer out of my garage, you know, double dry hop with Galaxy Mosaic and Citra. DDH, this, please. DDH, yeah, DDH, please. DDH with, with Citra and Galaxy Mosaic <laughs> this week. Um, you know, there is no storytelling there. And it's, it's really interesting because 12 years ago, there was a lot of room, I felt, for the Abbey brand to go that route. Um, and and it's, it's shifted tremendously and, and quite quickly. But those folks who are releasing the DDH, such a mosaic, et cetera, et cetera uh, have a line around their, the corner from their garage. Every day? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and some of the brands that have been around for, for a while longer that play into a, a lot of the heritage, um, it, it's been a tough go for a lot of you guys for the last couple of years. Us and, and the imports, I mean, the Belgians, you know, I mean, lots of people that have heritage and legacy. Those are two words you just don't want to be associated with right now. Um, and, and yeah, it's been tough, but this is a cycle, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're in the middle of something. And the question is, is where are we and, and what's next? And I think that's, that's a, big, a big thing that nobody can answer. Well, one of the things that you guys did uh, a couple of years ago, you launched the, the hop concept, mm-hmm. uh, THC. Clever, clever, clever. Very clever, right? Yeah, yeah. so, so dank, so clever. <laughs> so incredibly uh, leafy. <laughs> nobody, and, nobody, and nobody had taken it. How is that possible? It's so weird. All right. It's so weird. Yeah. Um, but you kind of had to do that, though, right? I mean, being in one in San Diego, which is uh, arguably the hop capital of, of the U.S., and I'm sure the folks in Denver and Vermont and uh, uh, other areas well, are, we'll are let him, We'll let me just right say it's now. one of the hop capitals, right? Right, but... Yeah. but when it comes to modern hop dankiness, pushing the uh, beer marijuana uh, label forward, uh, San Diego was, was, was chiefly among the first. But you guys hadn't been doing that uh, on, a, on a commercial scale or on a, on a, on a package release really scale for, uh, uh, on that level um, until then, really. And then you came out with cans yep. uh, a, a, as well. Was this something that 
you wanted to do? Is this something that you had to do? Is it a combination of the both? Uh, it's interesting because Adam and I worked on this project kind of behind the scenes, and then we, we brought it to everyone's sort of forefront. It was not, it was a it was a very uh, hush hush kind of thing while we were working on developing it, and. The, the, the thing that hit me was I walked into a t- the Tornado in San Diego, Tornado, a very famous beer bar in San Diego one day, yeah. and I looked up at the board, and I knew the producers, and I knew that these were Hold IPAs. On a second. It, it isn't the one, the, the one in San Francisco is a little bit more famous than the one it in San It is a little Diego. more famous, but okay. it's famous. The Tornado is certainly famous in San Diego. Okay. Uh, they both are. Um, so I walked in there, and I looked up at the board, and I, I stared at this, this board full of IPAs, because that's what's on tap, and I couldn't figure out what the beers tasted like. Mm-hmm. I had no idea, because I'd never seen them before. And, and this is right when Rotation Nation became the, the you know the, the leading cause of of, you know, of of change, and I decided that that we needed to have a little more straightforwardness in the direction of the beer in order to tell the consumer who might walk in, or the 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 sales rep who hasn't had a chance to sample it, or the bartender who hasn't had a chance to sample it. It tastes and smells as it as we're telling you. It's dank and sticky. It's citrus and piney. It, it's a incredibly left turn it's 180 degrees off the abbey message all story all all romance to this this is entirely what you're getting and uh and it was a very big departure for us how long was this in the works with uh by you guys at least six months before we before we went to market with it yeah yeah and it was the first time we actively engaged a a a marketing firm to work with the we took the branding to them and said, this is how we want it to look. And then we worked with them to clean up the hop freshener portion of it and develop the logos and the, and the work. Um, and it was very noticeable from, from the get-go that it was, a, it was an in-house sense of how the beer was going to be. But we got an outside set of, of eyes on it, and it was very, very clean. And, and it stood out. I mean, I, I remember talking with Adam at the time and you at the time when it, when it first came out because it did stand out on shelves uh, in, in a way. Uh, and it did differentiate itself with the actual um, uh, flavor and aroma descriptors on the can. And it's something that we actually still don't see a lot of today because the majority of the cans that we're seeing released are DDH, Citro Mosaic. And it doesn't actually give us, if you don't know what Mosaic is, if you don't know what Citra is, but you know that you're supposed to be excited by it, um, it can mean a different thing for yeah, I mean, they've, they've just basically told you that the, the reason to be excited is that Galaxy's in the beer. Yeah. I mean, there's no, you have no idea whether Galaxy's the, the prominent flavor or not. What you know is is that the word mosaic is supposed to get you excited, and Citra and mosaic together is supposed to get you even more excited. And, you know, Galaxy, mosaic, and, and Citra together. And shell out more cash. Yes, and Galaxy, mosaic, and Citra in combination means you're buying a flat, right? It's it's just an interesting mix of things. Um, it's, it's a very crazy environment right now and with respect to hoppy beers because so much of the beers that are on the market that are being promulgated as being IPA are not IPA in their makeup at all. They're not bitter. They're not They're not really you know hop resinous and things that have historically been IPA or the reason that IPA came to be. They're just using IPA as, a, as an associative to get you to say this is a catch-all now. I mean the category of IPA I, didn't, I, I couldn't have ever imagined could become this diluted. And you see it as diluted? I do personally because I think that there's a there isn't a real sense that the IPA, maybe not diluted, maybe it's fractured, but okay. maybe not fractured in a way that, I mean, if if everything is IPA, I think we saw a Kolsch IPA the other day. I think I saw, <laughs> you know, I mean, I I've seen some I've seen some very odd IPA based things. I mean, that's and they're more the poor shit to begin with. I but know. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're more not the they're more the exception than the norm. But the fact that we're back into this environment where people are even willing to to, to do that. You know, like I'm not a style purist, but the style, the style is supposed to point you in the right direction. And, uh, and, and look, if you want to call it a juicy beer, that's fine. You want to call it a juicy IPA because it has bitterness, that's fine. I just, there's, there's, some, real, there's some real laziness going on with some of the, the, the catch-all kind of naming of things. Right, but to push back on you a little bit for that, though, when you have your non-denominational beers where things that are inspired by, isn't that essentially what we're, we're seeing right now with IPAs? Yeah, that you took some well, Belgian styles and we did, but I tried to take some of the style off of it because I was saying that we weren't participating in that 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 lane. Right. And what we're hearing is is that the lane that used to be IPA that was you know this wide or it was too wide because there was English in this and now it's it's an eight lane highway. Right. But that eight lane you're highway making is, hand gestures on the radio yeah, by the way. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. You're welcome. But that eight lane highway on the radio is is uh, it's too it's too broad, right? But earlier you said uh, you don't put crap and beer unless crap and beer makes sense. Yes. So where's the line? Well, that's the problem, right? The consumer is actively engaging us in ways that, I I mean, I guess that they're so willing to have marshmallow in their IPA that it's fine. I mean, that's to me, that's the issue, right? 
Um, and ultimately, the consumer the consumer is the the person that's going to tell us whether or not you know it's supposed to be there. So if the consumer wants a marshmallow IPA, so be it. And there's there's some that are out there. I've had a few, and they they don't necessarily make me think of beer. They don't necessarily make me think of uh, a, a traditional IPA. Right. And 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 I'm with you, but I also wonder if we're dinosaurs in this whole thing. There's definitely the old man on the lawn thing going on right now yeah. for me because I'm this guy who just won an award for innovation in brewing and I, here I am calling out <laughs> brewers for being innovative like putting marshmallow in IPA. Um, and it's not lost on me. It's just, uh, I, it's, a different, it's a different way of painting. You know, It's a different set of strokes and, and I'm not sure that I will ever paint that way. What I find interesting though is having conversations with folks who stand in line at Other Half or Treehouse or Trillium or uh, any of the other hazy IPA makers. Um, and they have these great experiences standing in line and trading beers and uh, having this general camaraderie. These are also folks who haven't been to Belgium or haven't uh, taken a trip throughout Germany or haven't even gone to visit Sierra Nevada in Chico. Um, uh, or Asheville. Or Asheville, you know. But, or, but, but looking towards the past, they're only sort of living in, in the now. And, and I wonder if uh, when you're saying a hazier shade of winter and trying to get people to um, uh, tell a story and, and, and see things... What can we all be doing to better foster that? Because are, are, do you think we're in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a spiral right now where we could actually lose our beer traditions? I think there's some concern that there's some breweries that could lose their way. I mean, I mean if you think about what would happen if these you know, all of a sudden some 100-year-old breweries end up closing up shop because no one's buying their beer anymore. And, and maybe that's just the Darwinian nature of the beast, right? But it if... If their beer has been around for a hundred years and they have weathered storms and they can't weather them anymore, right? But their beer is important and it goes away. Then yes, we've lost something. It's very um, national historical registry sort of like you know. But we don't want to be dinosaurs. But if everything becomes shiny and new, then how are these guys that are you know three years old at, at year ten going to be doing something that that doesn't you know get them off the map either? Uh, you know, I I I. I think about the branding a lot because we have three brands and, yeah. and I wonder you know how do you how do you make those brands relevant and keep them relevant and it is about innovation for one um, and, it, and, and it is about a consumerism and right now the consumerism has shifted to a very uh, that Instagram forward you know uh, I got to have something new to take a picture of to make it to reason to stand in line kind of stuff um, it's a it's a massive landscape change from when we opened 12 years ago and it's amazing to me that it is only you know, 12 years. That uh, we've been open. Yeah. yeah. Because it, it, your brewery in particular has cemented itself in the general consciousness, I think, of most, if not all, beer drinkers, whether or not uh, they're drinking your beers regularly. And I think... Go, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. I think about it a lot, and it's a lot about if we had to open today. And you right, that's what that's yeah. where I was going to get to. How how would we do this differently today? And I think that that's probably one of the most challenging things for me because we we're 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 good. We've launched it, right? But now we can't just sit back and let it hang out there because it, it will get stomped on by by a lot of things. I mean, single bottle sales are not what they were a few years ago, and people people don't wait in line for barrel aged barley wines like they used to. Weird. So, yeah. So can you put them in a sixteen ounce sticker can? I'm sure we could, but yeah. I have an aversion to sticker cans, and everyone at the brewery <laughs> knows that. Um, so, yeah. But do you hit a point where... You have to? Yeah. I mean, that's the issue, right? Like, that is... You the, must have had these conversations. Oh, in my, in my head every yeah. night, yeah. Uh, I, I, I have been doing a lot of mental soul-searching over it, because it does, it does present a lot of problems to the economics of running your business, or whether or not it's you're too singular in your makeup. Um, you have to be a part of the business to stay in business. Right. But if you don't do things that got you to where you are, then why are you in the business? Like, if you're just chasing the, the, the dollar bills, yo, then what's the point? I didn't get into this business to make a lot of money. I got into this business to make things that I knew would matter and, 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 and I, could, I could do that were artistic. And, but you have to balance those two things. But I, 
Because it's not just you, though. It's the employees. It's the people who rely. The 50 people that we employ. And, yeah. and, and beyond that, the you know, how about the vendors that, you know, we buy from that, you know, employ people and stuff. You know, we, you were talking about cans earlier. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm very intrigued by the glass business right now. I'm interested to see how many, you know, oh, I just shut down one of their plants. Yeah. I was um, going to mention that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, this, there's some ripple here. We buy from a company in California called Saxco, um, very large glass supplier and to the wineries and breweries. And as every brewery shifts gears to more aluminum, um, you know, what does that do to, to their, their side of the equation? It's, it's very back, back of the channel. But it's certainly worth considering. Well, we're here in D.C. where the tariffs just went through uh, on aluminum. So maybe glass will swing back into favor. It's an interesting thought, isn't it? We all own bottling lines. <laughs> Boy, your eyes just yeah. lit up at that well, point. You're like, oh, this all, is, yeah. All, our, all of us own bottling lines that are, aren't running as fast or as, as often as they used to. So, um, you know, it's not an impossible reality. When do you get to a point, though, where I guess in the last few years, right, because for the first Let's just, for argument's sake, say nine years of the brewery's existence. Um, things were going along pretty well because the last three have really just been chaotic for everybody. What have you done to adapt in the last three years, aside from THC, um, uh, to, to sort of you know stay on top of the game? And is there a red line for you of something that you say, like, like we, just, we, we can't. If we do this, then we're not the company that we say that we are. Today, that red line is some sort of a hazy beer that that is, you know, just to make it, just to make it, to you know, fake it to make it. It's not something our brewers want to make, and it's not something I personally want to drink. So that would be a, that would be a, a strong red line in our world. Okay. Um, on the Abbey side, we brought out some six packs last fall of our farmhouse lager, uh, used to be known as Avant Garde mm-hmm. and Devotion, and that that's a space that we need to be in so that we can get into some grocery stuff. We now have cans on the port brewing side. We also have THC cans that are coming around. Mm-hmm. Um, those are formatting. That's an available thing that, that we have, you know, right 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 and center um but we've got to go back and re- retool the the portfolio it's just a, it's a known uh, it's a known thing but we've 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 got a big ship i mean we make over 60 beers a year between the three brands and turning that after turning formatting on is is a bigger bigger challenge so um i think 2019 is probably for us one of the, the more paramount years in, in our future because we've we're participating in a, in a, in a space that's very different than it was three years ago. And we've taken a lot of steps this year. We've been doing a lot of warehouse consolidation, uh, movement to be under one roof now that gets us a lot of financial gains. Um, Jim and I were geeking out about that last night from, from Sam <laughs> Adams, um, uh, because he understands the, the finances, the, the finance, most, yeah. the, 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 the consolidations and the finances, the part of it specifically, um, you know, because everybody has to get through this. It's a, is, you know, the question is, is, are you weathering a storm or are you coming out at the other side stronger? And, uh, you know, right now the, the business is not as easy as it used to be, and everyone knows that. Um, although there are people that are finding enormous easy success just throwing their doors open and selling things on Saturdays and, and killing it. Yeah, but where are they going to be? Well, that's, I think yeah. that's, that, is, that is the ultimate mystery, and, and, and I hope that they all, you know, stop long enough to think about that. Because that's, that there is, uh, this has been a flash in the pan mentality. There are, there are places that aren't with us today that were with us 10 years ago um, that, that, that were, you know, that... that that, that even had good business models, uh, you know, too much risk and, and, and too much, you know, lack of, of, of you know, projection and, and, you know, thinking that this was going to go on forever is going to burn more than a few people. I feel, though, that you're putting a lot of onus on the actual business owners themselves, where it is the consumer dollars that drive this. And, and, and I'm wondering where that plays in as well, where if the consumer doesn't... <sighs> I'm going to be blunt and just say, if the consumer doesn't care that a brewery is not going to be around 10 years from now, right? is that the right, you know, are, isn't it ultimately their choice? Ultimately, yes. Um, but I think that that's, I mean, I, I, for me personally, it's like, so if Candy Owen went out of business tomorrow, the world would notice, right? And the consumers who said, oh, I just, I don't. I don't want to give them money or otherwise, and then all of a sudden it's gone, and you lament the fact that it's gone. Sure, uh, that's tough to come back to. There are plenty of places that don't have the haven't earned the right to be around for a hundred years or whatever number that is. Sure, and that's that's just business, right? That's just people put your money. You know, the consumers put their money where their where their dollars are, or their, you know, their money. They, they shop where they where they want to be. I feel that that we as owners have a little bit different view. You know of this because we employ those people and my job is to right. tell people that have been you know five years in ten years in you know that that, that may not be able to come out of this with a, with a you know an equally good job 
that that their time wasn't wasn't rewarded or you know we we failed them in, in a very strong sense so yeah how do we get the consumer to, to be relevant or how do, how do our beers remain relevant to the consumer and and that's i think the, the thing that's been most challenging in the last few years is understanding what the consumer wants today and what are they going to want five years from now I, it just occurs to me though in we talk about uh I, I, I just I want to talk about television for a second yeah. because there are shows that come along that everybody celebrates and then Roseanne uh, <laughs> topical this isn't going to air for like I don't know like a month and yeah this is this is great it's not live you know this is us like sitting with uh, with my backpack in a in a hotel lobby Tommy perfect um, yeah let's go back to television Roseanne come yeah on. great television Murphy Brown topical. yeah good job. <laughs> Well, but let's talk about a, a TV show that's not on the air anymore, uh, uh, The Office, right? When Steve Carell left The Office, the U.S. version of it, the show, admittedly, uh, I, I, the, the creators have said, like, fell off the rails, right? It, it should have ended when he left. But they, they keep it going for profit or they keep it going because they're, they're, there's demand. Do you think that we will start to see breweries uh, in the same way that have... Yeah, there's some there's some shows that have great limited runs like the wire was five seasons and you know it was excellent or you know lost when they finally decided that they were going to end it after seven uh, they said okay now we have an end date in in, in sight there's a, a New York Times article that came out on this show on HBO called Barry uh, which has already been renewed for a second season but they said they should just stop it at the first because it was so perfect it was great eight episodes of perfect television it doesn't have to to repeat itself. We grew up in a culture where the breweries that survived Prohibition here in the U.S. or Cantillon or some of these others that have been around for 100 years, we expect that this is a business that when it opens, it will last forever. Can we get to a point where there's just a natural ending point for things? And, and that, that's maybe what we're seeing, right? That might be yeah. a big a big part of what's what is, is that occurring. one of those big leading questions that you're well, uh, against I, early on yeah, yeah. I, I feel i feel like there's a real strong sense of okay are you know if you've made it 150 years and then all of a sudden you have to close your doors was that was that a good run you know or was that you know is 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 the goal of any brewery that opens up to be a legacy brewery um you know are you supposed to be in business for 50 years are you supposed to 20 years and you close your doors and no one cares no one knocks on your door with a big check at 21 years and says we're going to buy you and at year 22 you, you just decide that you're done um i don't know what i do know is is that when you're an entrepreneur and you open your doors you come to work every day and you fight and you do everything you can to keep the doors open because that's that's your 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 whether it's your baby or otherwise but it's it's your your model and you have employees and so you have to you have to find ways to do that but Smart business people, I think, do wind things up when they realize that there is no reason to, to continue. Um, foolish people come to work every day and think that they, they do matter. But if you're making beers that matter and people aren't those. buying them, then this is a problem. Um, and maybe maybe you aren't enough. You know, if they're not buying your beer, then maybe maybe it isn't worth. Maybe you're not making great beer. But what I would hate to see is a bunch of great breweries who've, who've weathered a lot of storms um, lose it for for no good. What, what amounts what I would amount to be no good reasons. Can Lost Abbey continue without you? Yeah, I think so. The ego says no. Um, Adam's shaking his head. Um, I, I, I think well, no, so. Because you're so wrapped up in. And, yeah. and, I, and I, I, I look at Boston Beer and, and Sam Adams with Jim Cook or this other first name club uh, that, that you are very much a part of where the person is so wrapped up uh, in, in the identity of the brewery. Uh, and for a you know a, a, a dozen year old business, um, it, it seems like yeah you got you know another you know fifty years in you yeah. um, you know maybe not the way you're living but like but you could um, I, I just I wonder though if we've put too much stock into the person attached to a brewery where can we survive after that Yeah, I'm I'm working really hard at the brewery with our guys right now to. Um, I'm, 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 I'm letting them go on projects further than they've ever sort of had the control to go down the path. Um, I'm in this business 22 years and I feel like I could go another 20 all day long and I'm, I'm in my mid forties. So it's not that big of a deal, but do I really want to be in the business that long? You know, do I want to, do I want to take, you know, take a nice retirement and go and go out, you know, and enjoy that. 
doesn't really matter to me. Everybody I, wants that Pete Slossberg retirement. Yeah, yeah. they do. I, we see Pete from time to time. It's uh, <laughs> it's a good thing. He he's he's doing quite well in his retirement. Yeah, yeah. I, it, it'd be fun to be retired early. Don't get me wrong, but. Um, I, I will know when it's time to retire when I don't want to get out of bed and go to work. And that isn't something that I see happening currently, although I'd, I'd really like to get back to being on, on, on top of making some truly innovative things and really pushing the needle um, and having less of the business side be my primary focus. And I've definitely been working towards that at home. Second to last question, where do you see innovation then? Like where are you looking right now for inspiration? I think there's still some room within the hop space, but I, I am, I'm intrigued by where that's going to come from. Um, I think the level of communication that people are putting forth with the hop farmers and, and there's still some lower ABV hop things that aren't out there that I think will work. Um, it's I'm not going to give away the farm here, but there's no, I, yeah, there's definitely. I wouldn't expect yeah. you to, but you know, I, I, can't I blame think a guy for trying. I think there's a lot of room in the four to five percent alcohol space because I, I want to drink three beers a day. I want to I want to I want to have pub type beers, but I want I want that really crisp, bright, hoppy note. And I, 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 now that we've gotten way uphill with them doing hand motions again, um, now that we've gotten way uphill with uh, juicy and things, there's. Hops, hops matter to the consumer, so I, I, I suspect that some more innovation in that regard will, will, will come to the forefront. Sure. It hoppy, may not be me, but it's Hoppy it, it, Zima. Should. Yeah. No, I get it. Yeah, that's... that's uh, yeah, Hoppy Zima. <laughs> yeah, dry Hop Zima. <laughs> double vanilla, dr- vanilla Double, double, D- double DDH. Double DDH. Yeah. Vanilla yeah. DDH Zima. There you uh, go. Just patent it right now. Um, tell me, as we start to, to, to wrap up here, it's a question I've been asking uh, when I've been hosting this podcast here, and... Uh, I'm sure it's going to touch on some some of the things that we've already uh, uh, gotten into, but what's your hope for beer? So I'll go back to that line from the speech, which is that I, I always imagined that beer was supposed to take you to places. It was supposed to basically transport you to things that you didn't necessarily know. I, I think that beer should, should focus on that. I think if we can continue to focus on elevating the consumer's experience or, or deriving pleasures or things that they didn't see, you know, creating aha moments... Um, then beer will win. There seems to be this real strong sense that beer is fighting spirits and wine for categorization and, and share and all that. If we can find ways to keep creating aha moments and beer is that vehicle, then we'll win. And that's always been my mentality with respect to the things that we do. And that, that's why it's not esoteric. It's got to be, it's got to have an impression. And if it leaves an impression, then it will take you places you didn't think beer would. Tommy Arthur of the Lost Abbey. Um, thanks. For Cheers. sitting down. This has been this has been great, and uh, my thanks to all of you for listening. If you want to learn more about beer brewing and all that's happening with, with this great beverage, you can check out beerandbrewing.com. There you can browse articles, subscribe to the print magazine, or if you have a question for me, guests you'd like to hear, topics you'd like discussed, you can reach me at John Hall. That's J O H N H O L L at beerandbrewing.com, or join the conversation on Twitter at John underscore Hall. Tommy, really, thanks again. This was a lot of fun. I loved it. Thank you. And uh, we'll be back next week with an all-new episode. Thanks again for listening, and cheers. You got to check out Hops on Tap, new at the Farmer's Museum in Cooperstown. It's all about the history of hops growing and beer making, with special demonstrations and tastings leading up to their big event, Hopsigo, on August 18th. Listeners can get $2 off admission by visiting farmersmuseum.org slash hops. This podcast is brought to you by Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine for those that love to make and drink great beer. Learn more online or subscribe at beerandbrewing.com or find us on social media at craftbeerbrew.com.